Protectors of the Sunnah. Sunnah Baba. Protector of the Sunnah. Ina alhamdulillah, wa salat, wa salam Allah, wa rasulullah. Welcome to another session of our series uh, on the hadith class. This is the series in which we're discussing the 55 hadiths uh, on Islamic behavior and discipline. And this book was compiled by Sheikh Muhammad Saeed Atli. And today we're on hadith number um, 52. So we're almost at the end of this book. And this hadith uh, addresses... Uh, not falling in love with material things, which is a problem that many of us suffer with in this world. This hadith was narrated by Abu Dar. He said, when I was walking with the prophet at the Hura of Medina in the evening, the mountain of Buhud appeared before us and the prophet said, oh, Abu Dar, I would not like to have gold equal to this mountain for me, unless nothing of it, of it not even a single dollar remained with me for more than one day or three days, except that single dollar, which I would keep for repaying my debts. I would spend all that money uh, among the lost slaves like this and like this and like this. In other words, he was saying he would give it all in charity and he used his hand to point out that how he would give all the money, if he had money to equal that mountain, how he'd give it all away in charity. He said, oh, Abu Dar, uh, uh, and, and then Abu Dar replied and said, O oh, Prophet of Allah. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, those who have much money in this world, they will be the people who will be least rewarded in the hereafter, except those who do like this and give in charity. Then he told Abu Dar, remain at your place and do not leave it until I come back. And then he left and, uh, he, and, and he, uh, he left and went away. And when he left and walked away, Abu Dar heard a voice and he was afraid that something might have happened to the prophet and he went, wanted to go and find him. But he remembered the prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, telling him not to leave where he was standing. So he continued to wait. And after a while, the prophet came back, back and he said, oh, messenger of Allah, I heard a voice and I was afraid that something had happened to you. But I remembered you told me not to leave. So I remained here. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, I left because that was Jibreel who came to me and told me that whoever amongst my followers died without having joined partners in worship with Allah would enter paradise. Abu Dar then said, oh, Prophet of Allah, even if that person committed illegal sexual intercourse, and even if that person was a thief, the Prophet said, even if he had committed illegal intercourse and was a thief, Allah forgives all sins as long as the person did not die upon disbelief. This is a wonderful hadith that tells us so much. First of all, it teaches us that we need to learn to be content with the cotter of Allah. Whatever Allah has given you with in this life, you need to make the best of it. We have to be careful wishing and hoping for things that can bring detriment to us. Most people who are weak wish to be rich. You hear people 80, 90, 100 years old still talking about how they wish they was rich. And if only they had money, they would do this and that. These people will have nothing coming in the hereafter. First of all, they're discontent with the cotter of Allah. Secondly, as the prophet said, the people rich in this world, you know, they're going to be the last to come forth on the day of judgment because they succumb to that money, the same way these ignorant people succumb to the illusions and delusions of being rich. You know, we learned that from this hadith. The rich man is the one who has peace of mind. The rich man is the one who is content with what Allah has given him on his plate. Learn to make the best out of the situation that you have. That's the cotter of Allah, okay? Also from this hadith, we learn how whenever the prophet gave the companions a command, they obeyed him in that. He told Abu Dar, don't leave this spot, even though Abu Dar heard a noise. 
and he wanted to check on the prophet. He didn't move because he obeyed the prophet's command. How many of us obey him today? Most of us don't. Most of the men don't wear beards. When the prophet commanded you to grow your beard and don't trim it, look at all these famous speakers with trimmed beards. You know, look how you guys are celebrating his birthday and birthdays when he said, don't do this because this is shirk. You know, we need to fear a law. We are the worst Muslims created so far because we are the present generation. And we are so far away from the truth, it's ridiculous. If the prophet came down right now and told you not to move, you'd be the first one to jump and move. Shows how weak we are. And also in this hadith, we learned that Allah forgives all sins. And this is what we were talking about earlier. Like Sister Tony said in our discussion earlier, we have to be careful using the kafir word with other Muslims. Just because a sister doesn't wear hijab, just because that person's a fornicator. You know, as long as that person did not take their love for sex and put it over a law. As long as that person didn't take their love for something else and put it over a law, we can't call them a kafir. They're a weak Muslim. They'll probably do some time in hell, probably a whole lot of time. But eventually, Allah says he will let them out. Our struggle is to not do not one second in time. The believer doesn't want to do a second in hell. But for the weak Muslim, they may settle. They may settle for just doing a million years in hell. You know, so we can't call them kafir because Allah forgives every sin, even theft, even robbery, even rape. He forgives every sin except associating partners with him. So we have to be careful of that. So now that I've broken this hadith down, explained it to you, how does it impact you in your life? Who would like to start us off? Go ahead, take the mic. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. This, uh, this is a very good hadith. It allows you to know how, once again, just how merciful Allah is, you know, because he forgives everything except disbelief and that's 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 good right there and uh, but at the same time you know no buts but it, it allows you to think and to be on your guard about your actions your thoughts and your behavior you know as we go through life and, and, and uh, one last thing too it, it let us know just how the people respected and loved the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because they, they, and how they trusted him because they believed and they, they obeyed him just like he obeyed him. You know, when he told him not to leave and even though he wanted to leave because he thought Prophet Muhammad, you know, lost messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam might be in trouble. He didn't know what was going on. But he remained in that position until he returned. And that goes to show people can read things in a book nowadays, in a hadith, that Prophet Muhammad said, and still just put it down and keep on going, doing what they want to do. You know, and so it just shows that, you know, a lot, a lot of our, our sunnah, we're losing. We're losing. You know, and we need to grasp it back, work on that. Exactly. MashaAllah, anyone else would like to share? Anyone? Um, Go ahead, Char. I wanted, okay. Um, so I wanted to say um, this is good because I think a lot of people, especially nowadays, get too caught up in the materialistic things and think that you know, this world is like forever and they totally forget about the hereafter. And, you know, I know some, well, I've seen some people who've even been to like, you know, Genesis multiple times and they never really take that in. And I've been there once and it changed my life forever. But it just shows like how, you know, it also goes back to like your upbringing too, but then also you would, you would also have to try to seek knowledge yourself without, you know, your parents. But 
we some people do think that this life is forever i'm not gonna lie sometimes i fall victim into that you know forgetting about the hereafter but then i have to like you know remind myself that this world is not forever and Allah can take my soul anytime and this year i've learned so much about that because he took so many people that i know life and you know from young to like old and it's just a reminder every day to always be humble and remember a lot to the best of my abilities and don't get caught up into the little things and always try to remember your religion and also have that like you know that balance in life you know there's a time for this and a time for that and that's something that i'm still working on but alhamdulillah i'm doing good so far <laughs> alhamdulillah mashallah yes go ahead sister amina yeah, this was a good reminder on um, <clears throat> it's a time for this and a time for that. Ain't nothing wrong with money, but what you do with money is what it's saying to spend it for charity. If you have if he had all that money, he said he have he had just keep enough to pay his bills and he would give the rest away. So that that told me that it's OK to have money. It ain't nothing wrong with having money. It's what you do with the money. Exactly, guys, you know, how, what you do with it, you know, are you using it to help build for the future, you know, the hereafter, or are you using it just to live off the life of this world, you know, so this is a wonderful hadith for us to ponder, you know, especially those of us that want to be rich all the time, you know, money is an amina, it's a trust between you and Allah, and when Allah uh, blesses a person with money, they don't understand that's a, a trust, they're going to have to account for every penny of it. How many people did you help? Did the people have to beg you for help or did you help them automatically? You know, did you take care of your family the right way? Did you take care of all your resident residence rights? Like we talked about before, you know, some people uh, will go and work in food pantries. You know, I know a lot of Muslims, this is a new thing here. A lot of sisters on my website do it too. I'll talk on the phone to a couple of sisters. Oh, I got to go on Friday to the food pantry. I'm like, what's a food pantry? I thought it was a store here where I live. People go to buy food, <laughs> you know, pantry kitchen. I didn't know. They said, Layla, the masjid, the masjid, you know, does this volunteer work. I think most masjids across America have a food pantry now, you know, to help those who are in need. And, uh, you know, we have to think about it while we're at the mosque helping donate food, you know, to non-believers and even Muslims. You have to check your family. Is there anybody in your family in need of food? You know, you got a sister, your, your blood sister over there going through a hard time because she's been her husband's been laid off from work. You know, she ain't got no food in her house. How are you going to go help give to the cappers or give to other people when charity begins at home with you and your family? You know, you got a son. You know, I did. We, me and my mother were talking about that. You want to go to the food pantry and help donate food to the cappers. But your son, you know, is out in the streets. Your son is walking the streets, drugs or whatever. But he ain't got no help. He ain't got nobody to take no food. Allah is going to ask us because your charity is not accepted there. Allah is going to ask you, why were you working at a food pantry, helping them when you had a, a son or, you know, you had a sister, you know, or your cousin, you knew was going through a hardship living in the street, you know, and you didn't do nothing to help them. You know, we have to, this is how shaitan gets us. Those of us who are strong in our faith, we have to be even more cautious. Because Shaitan know that he can't get you with those prayers. He can't get you with Ramadan. He can't get you with the, the basic obligations that he jab. He going to come at you with things you never thought of. Why am I volunteering at the Masjid Food Pantry? You know, when my sister, husband just been laid off. And I can go and, 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 and give, donate some food to them from out of my cupboard. You know, why am I working at a food pantry helping Kaffirs when my own blood is in living in the street? Allah is not accepting that charity. He's not. Remember, Allah does not accept our voluntary deeds. Unless we fulfill our obligatory ones. And that's another means that Shaitan uses to dupe us. He'll make us put all our emphasis on doing deeds that are voluntary. 
but we don't do the obligatory. How many sisters email me every day? Dear Sister Layla, I'm doing voluntary fast, but I never made up my Ramadan. Well, all you're doing is starving yourself because you don't have to do a voluntary fast. You don't have to do uh, Ashura or any other fast except Ramadan. Allah is not going to reward you for any other fast if you ain't completed Ramadan. And you only got to the end of the beginning of the next Ramadan to complete it. You know, you're giving your charity to a bunch of Kafirs. You're giving your charity to other people and other organizations when your blood relative is sitting here living on the street. That's how shaitan gets those of us who do practice. We were like, oh, I didn't think of that. So all that charity is wasted because it didn't go on that relative over there. The kinship. Guys, I'm telling you, I understand that hadith about the kinship so much now. The kinship is under the throne of Allah. Right underneath that preserved tablet is the kinship. We got to check our blood relatives, especially your mother, your grandparents, your aunts, your uncles, your uh, nieces, your nephews, your sons, your daughters. We got to check to make sure we do what we supposed to do for them before we go that extra mile to anyone or anywhere else. OK, are there any other comments? Any other comments? OK, uh, before we close, I want to let everybody know that, inshallah, don't forget, we have the Quran Tajweed class tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, the, we will be going over uh, Surat El masad OK, Dr. Asim um, will not be able to join, but we do have a bona fide qualified um, substitute. Inshallah, my sister-in-law, she's Arabic and she has um, Ijazah and Quran Tajweed. She's memorized the Quran by heart and she speaks Fusha and she has a degree in Islamic studies. She graduated from a school in, in, uh, in Medina. She will be here to teach Quran Tajweed uh, tomorrow for us to substitute. And I might try to see if I can get her to do beginners class too. So I'm trying, we trying to get people in here to teach y'all how to read. I think that she would be the prime person if I can get her to do it, you know, and put the grand, the, my nieces and nephews to the side. So inshallah, make sure everybody's here at six o'clock for the Quran Tajweed class tomorrow. And then don't forget all the other classes. Tomorrow is the resurrection. Tomorrow is the my series on the resurrection. And it's at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. All right. So I'm closing out here on Facebook. We're live in the Zoom. Subhanakalahuma wa bihamdika. Ashadu an la ilaha ila anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. And let me see the button to stop recording.